I found the same parable in Matthew and discovered that it sits in a very different place. And it sits in a, in a very different conversation. Luke 15 is all about God's wandering the world to find the people that he wants to bring in. About Jesus looking out for the lost coin, the lost son, the lost sheep. Matthew 18 is all about humility and what to do when we fight. And right in the middle of that, Jesus stops and tells that story again. Heaven's a bit like a farmer that has a hundred sheep and one goes missing. So this is called Win Them Back. I don't know if you've uh, come across that. It's been a bit of a sad story. But it's also a good thing to keep in your head because that is a sycamore tree. I haven't ever been able to picture one. I just knew there was someone in it. So, our passage. If a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell them. Work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you've made a friend. If he won't listen, take one or two others along so that the presence of witnesses will keep things honest and try again. And if he won't listen, tell the church. And if you won't listen even to the church, you'll have to start over from scratch and confront him with the need for repentance and offer again God's forgiving love. That is Jordan, uh, sorry, Eugene Peterson's uh, paraphrase of uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And our passage comes after Jesus telling the story of the lost sheep. So the lost sheep runs straight into this. But I want to take a minute to widen out the lens to the whole of, of, of Matthew chapter 18 because I think in that wider view, Jesus gives us everything we need to safely handle these verses because our passage floats in a sea of humility, caution, and care. To handle this passion with care, we need to center ourselves in these surrounding passages. We're going to need a radical humility that sees the world as a child, an extreme caution that understands God's anger at those who mistreat and mislead the young, the simple, and the vulnerable, a ruthless self-examination that is willing to sacrifice and endure pain to att attain holiness, a holy concern for the lowest and the least, from a deep-seated understanding of heaven's care for God's little ones, an act of grace, driven by a profound grasp of God's desire to seek and save and an inexhaustible forgiveness that forgives seven times a day, 70 times seven. So let's look at that context. Matthew 18 begins with the, the, the disciples and they're asking, who's going to be the greatest when the kingdom come? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Only right answer. And Jesus puts a child in their midst and says, if you want to be the greatest, you've got to become like a child. So radical humility, 18 verse 3, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Kids don't have all the answers. They've got all the questions. Your parents, you know this. I used to have to just limit my son's questions. He'd come up to say goodnight, and I'd be, you can ask five things. And I'd put up 10 on purpose so that he'd only ask about 14. <laughs> Inflation is a terrible thing. They don't have all the answers. They don't have all the resources. They know they need the love and resources of their father to do whatever it is they want to do. And we've got to become like kids. We've got to find that innocence and that trust and that simplicity and that willingness to learn. So a radical humility. There also needs to be an extreme caution because after verse 3 comes verse 4. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones to believe, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned upon the depths of the sea. This is Jesus not mincing his words. 
So there needs to be an extreme caution as we exercise our relationships because to the extent that someone is the least and the lowest, to the extent that someone is vulnerable, to the extent that someone is childlike and innocent, God has their back. And he will come down hard. There needs to be a ruthless self-examination. This is eight verse 8, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better for you to enter life crippled and lame with, than with two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. Getting free of some stuff is painful work. Getting free of addiction, getting free of resentment, you have to keep cutting until the hand comes off. And every stroke hurts. Getting free of a judgmental heart sometimes feels like you have to see the world entirely differently. Like maybe it would just be better if the eye came out. N.T. Wright said anyone who's ever tried to break a bad moral habit will know that it sometimes feels like cutting off a hand or a foot and anyone who's tried to stop a bad attitude towards others will know that it's almost as hard as plucking out an eye. Praise Jesus we don't do it alone. Praise Jesus he's always endured more than we have already. He knows exactly what pain is like. He knows exactly what it is to take on this particular sin and fight until it's forgiven. That's the story of Esther. All sins, your sins, my sins. Amen. We'll need an awareness of divine care. This is an incredible verse. Jesus says in 18 verse 10, See that you, not dis- say that you do not despise these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the faith face of my Father who is in heaven. Do you remember in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah sees the Lord seated on the throne, exalted, and the train of his low filled the temple with glory. You know the song. And the seraphim are there, and they've got six sets of wings. Do you remember what they're for? Two to fly with, two to cover their eyes, and two to cover their feet. Do you know why they cover their feet? Neither do we. No one knows. It's opaque to us anymore. Can't work it out. But they cover their eyes. And they cover their eyes because God is so holy. And this is what Jesus is saying. Is that the angel that is, that is assigned to the lowest and the least gets to drop his wings and look straight into the eyes of the Father. You know when you walk into a room and something's not right because you clock that look on your mum's face and you go, ooh. I need to be over there. Or you see your brother across the room, or your friend across the room, or you're sitting in a cafe and you're looking at someone having a phone conversation that you know and love, and you go, I'm needed. I can see their face. The angel that serves the children of God looks straight into the face of God. So we need this awareness of divine care if we're going to handle the children of God if we're going to work with the children of God, if we're going to love people loved of God, God has his eyes straight on. God has his angels already assigned. And then we hit Mike's passage. And I'll quote one line from that passage, then leave it entirely to Mike's brilliant and thorough exposition. Just so excited. I just pray that it comes out in English. Sometimes it's all in tongues. <laughs> Matthew 18, 11 will have a note in your Bible that says usually this isn't in there, but it says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And I don't think it was in the original Matthew, but I do think it was exactly correct about the Son of Man. He came to seek and save and, and, and the farmer goes after the sheep because it's not my sermon and it's going to be brilliant next week. But the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. 
And then we have our, our passage, our passage that's right here. Matthew 18, 15 to 20. But if we step to the far side of it for the moment, the, God, the, uh, the disciples are arguing about what Jesus said in Luke 17. Because in Luke 17, Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back saying, repent, you must forgive them. And the disciples are doing exactly what I am doing. They are writing the code to apply this business logic. Right? When we count up the Excel sheet, right, as long as it stays an even multiple of seven, we've done enough forgiving, we can move on to the non-forgiving. And they asked Jesus, yeah, let me find this for a moment. Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Lord, can we, just, can we just get that in writing? Seven times is enough, right? And Jesus says, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. And 70 times seven is a great phrase because it just meant heaps and heaps and heaps. It wasn't meant to specify 77 or 490 or however you want to read it. It was just supposed to represent a bajillion. A number that didn't specify a specific amount, just more than you were thinking. It's the amount of donuts I would like to eat. (laughs) Diabetes disagreed. Seventy times seven. So it's in this sea of humility and divine care and forgiveness that Jesus drops into our passage. I'm going to read it from the ESV. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Truly I say to you, what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. That passage lands a little different in context, doesn't it? I want to claim it as a, as a, as a outside of all my relationships, please, Jesus. I just like the power. I don't want the responsibility. I don't want the humility. Forgiveness is difficult, uncomfortable, and I don't want to do it anymore. Thank you. But I would like some binding and loosening up in here. (laughs) But that's not what God has for us. God has for us this radical humility, this extreme care, and this laser focus on his lost one and his broken one, and this demand that we go fix it. Let's step through it. There's two ways you can read this verse, and I will confess to you, my first instinct is to read it the wrong way. When I want rid of someone, I just want to know what, what, what hoops do I need to jump through God to just be free of this? And so it's really easy, right? What I want to do is to kick them out. You state your case. You go one-on-one. This is what is wrong with you. And you bring a posse. You go two or three on one. I got me and my enforcers. You walk in like the mob. Someone, one of them can flip a coin. The other one can maybe look like he's packing heat. Step three, you get the whole church together and you make a scene. And then step four, Kick them out. You're done with it. Oh, feels nice to be done with it. Have it over with. Prosecute, recruit, give them the boot. Let's do it. (laughs) 
But there's a deep wisdom in this. If you won, let go of your judgment, which humility is going to make you do. If you too let go of your thirst for vengeance, which God's care for the lost and broken is going to make you do. And if you three just stew in God's desire to win people back, to go out and seek and save the lost, then this becomes about trying to win them back. Where step one, I go one on one. And I try to win them quietly. And step two, I go with some friends. Not friends, witnesses. And I try to win them safely. And step three, I come to the assembly. And I try to win them urgently. And then step four, I step away. And ask God to win them back. I'm the son of a pastor, and I'm the son of a Baptist pastor, which means I was at a church that liked meetings even more than you guys did. We had committees for our committee. I've seen this go wrong so many times. I'm a sinful son of a pastor, which means I've had times in my life where I've been the subject of this process, and I've seen it go wrong so many times. But I'm absolutely certain that if we could start living this win them back mentality, if we could start working with Christ to seek and save the lost and the broken, the people who sinned against us, that we can step out of years of brokenness. We can step out of years of sin and years of sorrow. We win them back quietly. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained a brother. So, some things to think about here. One, make sure you really go. If you're a little bit like me, you're kind of grumpy right now. Because in Matthew 5, Jesus says that if you approach the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, go to them. So it wasn't my fault. If I'm the hurt one, I wasn't supposed to go. I sit here and wait. It's their job to come to me. I'm the wronged one. They shouldn't be at church if they haven't spoken to me. And I should handle it the way any God-fearing Christian would do, by posting passive-aggressively on social media. (laughs) Now, I'm not a gossip. I'll leave out context. I'll put those context clues in the comments. If people go through to find them, that's on them. Or maybe I'll I'll, I'll post grumpily in the family messenger group chat. Or just a row of grumpy emoticons so the right people come calling. At my dad's old church, if you wanted something to get to everywhere, you just called someone on the prayer chain and said, don't tell anyone this. Everyone knew. (laughs) So one, make sure you really do go. Two, make sure you are intending to reconcile. One of the frustrating things about when you start to live this is that it works. And that's when you get a heart check because you, you, ga- you gather up all the momentum and the energy you need to actually talk about this without losing your cool, without there being tears. And you say, look, I want to talk about this. And they say, yeah, I've been thinking about it. I'm so sorry. And you go, no, I had a speech. I was going to be self-righteous and eloquent. Don't you dare offer forgiveness yet. I've not convinced you of your sin. (laughs) One of my favorite moments from a TV show is from the show The West Wing, and the the, the president and his wife are having a fight, and she finally apologizes, and she goes to say however, to say the thing that he's done wrong. And he says, no, just stand there in your wrongness and be wrong. And we want that. But God doesn't. God wants us to agree. God wants us to forgive. God wants us to move past it. So make sure you're actually intending to reconcile. Make sure you're pre- prayed up. Make sure you've taken this and given it to God. Because sometimes I take my frustrations, give them to God, and God goes, look at this fool to bits. And I get to the end of my prayer, and I don't have anything anymore. Just maybe some apologies for the way I've been thinking about my brothers, sisters in Christ. Make sure you're humble. Be re- make sure you are the injured party. 
it says, if your brother sins against you. Now, if it just said, if your brother sins, you're on. You are Jesus, private eye, junior, (laughs) investigating the dirty laundry of the church for the glory of God. But it does not say that. I am sorry. It says, if your brother sins against you, God wants us to fight our battles. God wants us to join us as we seek reconciliation. And God really doesn't want us fighting. Ask yourself the next time you're angry, are you affected? Are you part of the problem? Are you part of the solution? And if you're not, let it go. We spend our lives wound up about all kinds of things. Who's going to win the election? Either way, it's, it's going to be Chris appointing. I let my best times go right under. So, reconciliation, as you write, wrote this, often creates a closer bond than you had in the first place. Two, win them back safely. If he does not with, listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, this is really interesting, because in the Old Testament, if I wanted to convict Nui of something, I had to find two or three other people that had seen Nui do the wrong thing. I think Nui's selling drugs. <laughs> David, we're going to go watch, because I need two or three witnesses. I can't just denounce him. He goes out, he comes home with little vials. He's panning for gold. I'm wrong. Just <laughs> He needs some to sprinkle on people every once in a while. Two or three. But here, there are witnesses to the conversation and the attempt at reconciliation. They're not called as witnesses to Nui's sin. They're called as witnesses to the conversation where you try to seek again. And you, when you bring in those people, you may find that it falls apart. And you say, look, this is what I think. This is what they did to me. This is where it hurt. This is why they were wrong. And they go, you are crazy. Take a deep breath. And you say, but I went one-on-one and they didn't agree. And they said, because there's nothing there. So when you go for when you ask for witnesses, you're asking for people to see the same thing that you see. And if they don't, then you step out. The two or three witnesses are not merely to report on the offender's attitude if he does not listen to them, but also to check the validity of the accusation. The accuser is not always right. Make sure you bring witnesses. I love this comment. Jesus is not instructing us to bring witnesses to testify against our brother who has sinned against us, but to testify to the exchange between brother and sister. This is not just about safety in numbers, but safety of the numbers. We want to keep everyone safe. And we need to remember that witnesses aren't advocates, and they're not enforcers, and they're not inquisitors, and they're not bodyguards. And lastly, we win them back urgently if he refused to listen to them, tell it to the church. And the word here, this is kind of a funny verse, word to put in Jesus' mouth in Matthew 18, because the church hasn't been established yet. To them, church meant something longer. That's not the word he's using. It's the word ecclesia, and it just means gathering. Talk about it when you're together. It literally means the called out ones. Hey guys, do want to think? Come up, come on out. That that gathering is the ecclesia. And here we need to make sure we are an ecclesia and not a crowd. Soren Kierkegaard wrote an incredible little treatise called "The Crowd Is Untruth," and he says a crowd, in its very concept, is untruth, since a crowd either renders the single individual wholly unrepentant and irresponsible, or weakens his responsibility by making it a fraction of his decision. We need to be a gathering of the body of Christ. And that means that out of the many of us, we form the one Christ. And so we take our decisions and our prayer 
and our meditation on what's in front of us seriously. And we come to agreements together. Being church isn't enough. Even just being pro-Jesus sometimes isn't enough. The same crowd that sang Hosanna to the son of David and watched Jesus came in saying, bring us Barabbas and watch Jesus die. This is, we're not talking about a democracy. We're talking about the body of Christ gathering and seeking the mind of Christ through the spirit of Christ and finding unity in that decision. That's not something we do by stepping back and only taking one 126th of this decision. And then we ask God to win them back. If he refuses to listen, even to the church, let him be as a Gentile and a tax collector in the mouth. Or sorry, as a Gentile and a tax collector. In the mouth of Jesus, a pagan and a tax collector clearly implies one that is excluded, is that the one that is excluded is there to be won back. In 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, uh, Paul's writing into a situation where a man is involved in, let's call it the kind of grossest sin. So that one of those kind of sins we'd all agree on. But Paul says, you are to deliver this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Even that guy who's all the way outside of our understanding of righteous behavior, who's all the way outside of our understanding of, of what, what it means to be a follower of Christ, who's all the way down the road of sin. Paul's like, let him go. Let's hope he comes back. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, readmission to the community or salvation is the purpose of church discipline in all its stages. It is throughout a pedagogic procedure all the way through. It's just designed to teach us we've got to go back We've got to go back. We've got to repent. We've got to turn back. We've got to make peace. We've got to apologize. We've got to fix it. We've got to atone. Maybe pay some penance. So we ask God to win them back. And then this incredible passage, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if the two of you agree on earth about anything, if they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. We're playing for keeps. God doesn't want to unpick the peace I find with David when we finally come to terms over the way I heard him. God doesn't want to undo the forgiveness that I find with my wife as she comes to terms with, with, with ways that I've, that I've disappointed her and God and my family. God isn't in the business of undoing the salvation and forgiveness that we do. What we bind and what we loose is forever. We are playing a game for keeps. Everything you know will pass away. Everyone you know will last forever. Which means the conversations you have tomorrow will echo in heaven for eternity. Because what we bind here is bound here and what we loose here is loose here. And then Jesus promises to be a part of it. That if we gather to seek reconciliation whether it's one-on-one -on -one when I've hurt David, Jesus will be there. Whether it's four-on-one -on -one when I haven't listened and David has found some people to come and pray it out and talk it out, Jesus will be there. And whether it's all of us together, Jesus will be there. And the hope at every time is that we want him back. This is that full passage in the message translation. It says, If a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him. Work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you've made a friend. If he won't listen, take one or two others along so that the presence of the witnesses will keep things honest and try again. If he still won't listen, tell the church. 
And if he won't listen to the church, you'll have to start from scratch and confront him with the need for repentance and offer God's forgiving love again. Take this most seriously. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. What you say to one another is eternal. I mean this. When the two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. When two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. We started with that picture of a sycamore tree. It was interesting, the conversation, because the first headline was that a 16-year-old kid had been arrested. And if you read online the response, it was all youth culture, and this is the insidious influence of of influencer culture, and this is what you get when people live more for TikTok than the real life world. And in that conversation that I was reading, there was an arborist who said, there is not a 16-year-old kid in the world who can cut down a 300-year-old tree without help. And 48 hours later, they arrested a 60-year-old man. We're all broken. Sometimes the sycamore tree falls. Our goal is to pray for the 16-year-old and the 60-year-old even if we need to mourn the tree. Our goal is to make sure that we are looking in the sycamore trees of our life for people that we can welcome back, for sinners that we can bring in. Our goal is to look through our life for people that we can fix things with and go to and apologize to. My heart is broken for the people that haven't found Christ yet and heard of Christ yet, but my heart is also broken for the people that found Christ and heard of Christ here and then just wandered off and we didn't chase them down and pull them back. I know we need to go into the highways and the byways, but we need to go across the hallways and down the driveways. We know where they are. We know where they live. And we can seek reconciliation and we can seek forgiveness and we can seek more unity and those people will show us more of who God is because we all together are the image of God. Amen? In C.S. Lewis's book, I'm contractually bound to make one C.S. Lewis reference. (laughs) In C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, he imagines hell as a great empty city because the people used to live together and then they fought with their neighbors and they moved a little bit further apart. And then they fought with their new neighbors and they moved a little bit further apart. And so standing in the center of hell, there's no one for miles and miles and miles. And if you travel for a lifetime, you may find someone, but you will offend them and they will leave you. And that is the opposite of heaven. Because we love each other and we forgive each other. And if you offend me, I go find you. And if I offend you, I pray that you'll find me. Because the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And the Father's will is that no one is outside of the body of Christ. Amen? Sweet. All right. We are going to sing. And we're going to speak the name of Jesus. The amazing thing about this entire process is that beginning to end, there's always two or more. If I go to David for forgiveness, there's two or more. So Jesus is there. We can speak Jesus in the presence of Jesus with the power of Jesus in every conversation that we have with every believer. And Jesus is always about the work, finding the people so that if they don't yet know Jesus, then Jesus is there seeking the salvation of that person. It's an incredible underwriting of our life of forgiveness and reconciliation. So as you stand and speak the name of Jesus, I pray that you just think of the people that you can reach out to. Let's pray. Father, we call your spirit on these people here, on this gathering, and we ask that you would tell us who we could be called to so that we could do this all together, so that we could all be the body of Christ and everyone could be involved. Father, I pray that if we have sinned against people, that you would call us to them to find peace. 
I pray that if people have sinned against us, you would call us to them so we can seek reconciliation. Most of all, Father, I just pray that Jesus has more of an impact in every conversation, in every relationship. Let us speak the name of Jesus. Christ's name.